thing, you know, uh, it helped me uh, tremendously a lot. And again, I got it from Buddy Rich. Um, when I was able to talk to people, Billy Cobham, Billy Cobham just confirmed it. Because that's what he worked on. He worked on some, you know, pillows as well. But then I found out that marching band drummers use pillows as well. And, you know, like anybody that have like tremendous speed, power, and control, worked on pillows. Hmm. You know, um, so it helped me a lot. Uh, I don't practice anymore. I stopped practicing when I was like 19. But I'm playing all the time. If I wasn't playing all the time, then I would practice. But, yeah. Yeah. You, you just mentioned uh, Buddy Rich. Yeah. Uh, I've read that you've um, you had the chance to see Buddy Rich once from behind the drum set, yeah. and while he was playing, his drum on uh, his uh, drum pedal oh, yeah. broke, but he still kept uh, playing uh, tremendously well. Yeah, I talk about this every night, you know, because that was a phenomenal uh, discovery for me to, to see uh, what happened. I don't know if the pedal, I don't know if the spring popped off, came off. I don't know. He didn't have a spring on the pedal because he played the left. He put his right hand down on the bass drum while his left hand would, was playing the snare drum. He's doing an answer the call thing between the left and right hand. He's looking around for the tech. He couldn't find him. He pulls the beater back and he's feathering uh, quarter notes. You know the bass. solo he goes up to from eighth note to sixteenth note and then he goes from sixteenth notes to thirty thirty second note. then he goes from thirty second notes to sixty four and the, the, the top I mean his top half is like the hands are disappearing but you know the bass drum is like playing sixty fourth notes without a spring on the pedal but you know when I got a chance to talk to him about it you know he said he had um, this is something that he has stumbled across because he was a tap dancer. He used to tap dance. So he took the same technique and used it with, uh, to the bass drum just to see what happened. And that's why he was able to do that. It did work. <laughs> yeah, it worked. I mean, because first of all, by doing that, you, you learn exactly where the balance, uh, the balance point in the footboards are on the pedals. Because, you know, every pedal is different. You know, Tamas pedals different than Yamaha. Yamaha's different from Pearl. Pearl's different from Ludwig. You know, uh, Ludwig is different from Stimul. Stimul in front. So, you know, you learn exactly where those balance points are. You know, very quickly and easily. You know, by uh, you know working with uh, pedals that have no spring on. And uh, you know, the Japan audience is very beautiful. But they're very polite, you know? They're very polite people, so, and they're shy. You know, when you step outside of Japan, everything is different. You know, people are a little bit more bolder. People scream out things, you know? But Japan, they have to do that. Especially young musicians. You know, if you want to become a great musician, you have to study all styles of music. You don't have to master them, just understand them and understand what make that thing work or that all those different styles work. So, therefore, 
you know, when I, you know, the reason why I work the way I do is because, you know, or, yeah, I mean, the reason why I work the way I do is because I, I understand it. I didn't master it, I just understood it. So I get called to do a rock gig, I get called to do a Latin gig, I get called to do a funk gig, I get called to do a jazz gig. I get called to do podcasts. Because I understand it. So it's like I don't walk into the gig or the recording studio and it's the Dennis Chamber show. Because when somebody gives when somebody gives you a chart, it don't say Dennis Chambers on it, it says drums. And you have to treat it that way. And you know, you have to be very musical. You know, and it's not about like, hey, I'm Dennis Chambers and look at all the chops I can play. It's not about that. It's about the music. When I go and play with Santana, when I go and play with Billy Sheehan, uh, it's two separate identities and it's two separate roles. You know, when I play with Palmer Funkadelic, when I play with the Brecker Brothers, when I, I mean, it's it's all these different things that land, uh, John McLaughlin. It just, it's, it's a different thing, it's a different animal. See you play something like this, that they come for Lens Challenge. What is that you hope they will walk away with? I just hope they walk away with uh, understanding exactly what I'm trying to present or what I'm trying to come across to them. I mean, I, um, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, people know me as being a, a very fast player. You know, I got chops, you know, but. Um, also, I'm very, very dynamic, you know, like the volume goes like way up and way down, you know, and, uh, and, and, and whatever I play, I feel, and also, you know, I try to, you know, uh, come across as very musical as possible, I'm not just playing just anything, when I sit down and play, I'm, I'm thinking about, like, how to make this musical as possible, how to, you know, like, uh, thread through, different things that I'm trying to do because I got a lot of things on my mind when I play. You know, I, I may go through, you know, a, 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 a rendition of an Art Blakey moment. I may go through a rendition of a Tony moment. I'll go through a rendition of a Billy Cobham moment. But the thing is, I gotta make it musical. You know? You know? Everybody know Dennis Chambers from How About the Men, which are uh, known uh, you know, I got, a, I got a serious thing about kids, and I, um, you know, it kind of breaks my heart, you know, when people, you know, bring kids into the world and, 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 and abandon them, or, you know, treat them less than, than human, human beings. You know, you got people out there who, who uh, they worship dogs. Better than they worship the kids. I, 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 I can't understand it. I can't, I can't understand it. It breaks my heart when I see, you know, when you a kid uh, or a child when it, when it comes into the world. I mean, that's the most precious thing in life. And and it's like what you put into that child, that's what comes out of that child. Uh, it's it's really an innocent me. Innocent. Innocent. They don't know anything. The only thing they know, they, or they know that they're breathing, and they know when they, they open their eyes, they see something. So therefore, it's like, you know, from that moment on, you know, from the, you know, when they're infants up until when they're like five years old, they only know, they only know what you teach them. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of kids are being taught ugliness. Ugliness, you know, and uh, it breaks my heart you know, when, I, when I see that happens. You know, when especially when you have kids having kids, you know, and you know people who are not ready to have them, you know, and they have them, you know, 
unexpectedly, it was a mistake or whatever have you, but they, they brought them into the world. I always. And then they abandoned them. It's like, you know, kid can't protect it. A, a child can't protect himself. It needs, it needs to be nurtured. It needs to be protected. And when I see kids who are, you know, like in these shelters, it kills me. It really kills me. There are some kids who are in shelters because, you know, okay, circumstances presented themselves to be that way. Like, you know, that maybe the mom or the, the dad abandoned them. And the mom was the one that took care of him. And then the mom had AIDS and she died. Okay, well that's that's one thing. But you know, like the, the mom had sisters and brothers, hopefully, or had a had a had a mother or grandma. You know, like they can't take up, but whatever. Yeah. It just it just tears me apart when you see that happen. You know, you go to Africa and you 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 see these things, you know, kids behind barbed wire fences, like like the animals. I can't take that, man. I can't take it. I can't take it. Let me try to explain something to you. You know, like I played, I started playing drums at the, the age of four, you know, 1960. So, by me, you know, playing drums in the 60s, you know, I came through an unbelievable, unbelievable time period where music was really pure. You know, people, you know, were, were writing music. Music was basically and only basically writing what you felt. Mm -hmm. It was never about like trying to play like somebody else. And this is why you have like, you know, you can go back in the 70s, if you do research, just just block out, just say, you know, put 1970, 1970 groups, and then you find like all, all this different style of music, I mean, tons of them. And if you go and listen to all of them, none of that stuff sounds the same. Let's just let's just, say, let's just take jazz. And in the sixties, seventies, fifties, you know, there was all these unbelievable. They're, they're great musicians. You know, the only thing they had in common is just it's just that they played the same instrument. But when you listen to them, none, they didn't sound the same. None of them. drummers, those guys, none of those guys sounded the same. And the, the reason. Oh, what I'm trying to get at is, is just the fact that it was it was almost blasphemous to, to try to play like somebody else back then. Now, or, or, or when Steve Gadd, and not blaming Steve Gadd, but when Steve Gadd came on the scene, well, everybody wanted to, everybody wanted to Steve Gadd, you know, on their recordings. So therefore, you're the drummer who's on the date. They want you. They want you to play like him, just like you know people want. You to play like me, or they want you to play like you know a Dave Weckl or 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 whoever the flavor of the month is. They want you to play like that, and this is for me. It's the wrong thing to do. You know, if they're gonna hire you to 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 play on the music, they should allow you to express yourself over the track. Now, if you express yourself over the track and it's wrong, at least. You can walk out, out, of the, out of the studio if they fire you, at least you can walk out with your head up because you, you gave it your best. But how are you going to give it your best if you're going to try to play like somebody else? I remember when I first had uh, my first born. And my first born, I was like not ready for it. I was like, man, you know, I'm like, what about I, I can't be a father. Come on, I can't be a father. But then, you know, when, that, when, when my child was born, it changed my life. Then I, then I realized, it's like, the kid was here for a purpose. The kid was here to change, I mean, to really, to make me understand what life is all about. You know, because I was young and you know, I just wanted to have a party and have a good time. But, you know, made me responsible, made me realize that I was here for a purpose and I was here to, you know, to, to, uh, to be a responsible person. Yeah. Hello, Planet Drum Rehearsals. This is Dennis Chambers and Hopefully you, you will enjoy this.